Well, good evening, everybody. How are you all tonight? Uh, welcome to the first of our Softer Side sessions. Um, I'm Scott Adamson. I'm the Global Brand Ambassador at Tomato and Distillery, and I will be your host of sorts for these sessions. Uh, really, I'm just a guy who's very excited to talk to people about whiskey uh, in these times. Um, those of you that have been joining in on uh, Instagram throughout the week will know the background of this already, but for anyone that is uh, not sure why we're doing this, uh, obviously, everything's gone a bit mental at the moment. Um, we've closed our visitor centre for obvious reasons. Um, all our office staff are working from home and I and a lot of my colleagues are grounded. We've had to cancel a lot of travel and we're not getting out into the markets, into the festivals to see everyone that we, we love seeing and sharing a dram with. So we thought we'll take to social media to um, to rectify that and make sure that we can keep in touch and have a couple of drams. Um, if you're watching this in the future and you're not sure what I'm talking about, remember that time when you couldn't buy toilet roll and you were worried about how you were going to homeschool your kids? That's happening right now. Um, so every Friday night, I'm going to be sitting down, while this madness goes on, every Friday night, I'm going to be sitting down with another whiskey lover. Um, sometimes that'll be people that work at Tomato and Distillery. Sometimes it'll be people from the wider whiskey world. And we're just going to be sharing a couple of drams. Um, there will be a topic of the evening. Um, and I invite you all to join along and enjoy. And tonight, I'm going to be joined by my colleague and friend, Scott Fraser. So you're going to have two Scots. And we're going to be talking about the Tomatin Decades 2, which is over my shoulder here, Tomatin Decades 2. And the reason we're going to be talking about this tonight is that this whiskey just won a double gold medal at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. So it's an incredible liquid. We're very proud of it. And what we're going to do tonight is kind of go beyond the bottle and take you into the liquid itself. So I hope you enjoy. Scott, how are you? Good evening, Scott. How are you? Yeah, very good. How's your week been? It's been different, certainly. It's, yeah. um, I think it's been a culture shock for everybody trying to muddle through. I think we're in a very fortunate position. I've seen some pretty, pretty horrendous news coming in from across the world. Hopefully there's glimpses of positivity coming. So um, hopefully a, a little bit of uh, tomato this evening should be able to uh, help us through these times. Yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> no, no pressure. No it's pressure. So, how's your um, week been? Uh, like you say, different. For those of you in the chat that don't know, myself and Scott normally sit across from each other in the office. And uh, we're now all working from home and it's very bizarre and we're trying to figure out technology and things. And uh, it's been interesting. And it's been interesting to see how everyone's reacting. Just about an hour before we started talking tonight, the news came in that in the UK, all the pubs and restaurants are going to have to shut. And I know that for a lot of you watching already, that's already the case. Um, but I think we talked earlier on and the reaction from local businesses to this has been fantastic. The, the sort of ways that companies are adapting to this, uh, not having people in their restaurants and getting, getting uh, food and bottles of wine and bottles of whiskey out to people has been incredible to see. It's been it's just been wonderful to see actually just the sort of perseverance and and sort of and the attitude that people have taken where it's it's almost it's an, at most it's trying to help people so that people can have something to eat have something to drink. It's been really really nice to see. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember as well that we're once this all dies down, we're going to want to go back to these restaurants and cafes and bars, and um, it's good to do everything we can to make sure that they're still going to be there. So. Exactly, exactly. This this will not last forever. And so we need to remember that there's a lot of people out there that are going to be able to support us later on. Yeah, yeah. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about decades, but we're also going to be chatting a little bit about each other's sort of experience with whiskey and um, what, what we do a little bit more. Um, and everyone that's watching, comments, Feel free to ask us any questions you want. We can pop them up on the screen and uh, we'll answer them as much as we can. Uh, if they start flying in, though, excuse us if we don't keep up. We're going to be drinking six whiskeys tonight as well, so I expect this to get a little bit loose. 
Um, <laughs> it, it feels a little bit, Scott, like the lunatics have been left to take over the asylum here. I know, maybe the last two people I would select from Demat and to host the Paris Taste in, but it, it can go two ways. So that's the wonderful news about it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I was actually just thinking there, we we did a live stream with the Scotch Test Dummies about four years ago. And I think it's very interesting that it's taken a global pandemic for the marketing team to allow us to do this again. So. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let, let's hope it doesn't have to have to happen again for it to happen. So I'm sure we'll yeah. have a very good evening. I'm, I'm actually very excited myself to taste through these whiskies. I think perhaps individually I've tasted them all at some stage when you've been uh, passing some samples across the desk. But to sit yeah. down and do it for tasting like this is a wonderful experience for me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this is a tasting that. Um, I'm, I'm first of all, what I'd love to, what I'd like to say is, I'm really, really sorry that a lot of people won't be able to try these samples with us. Um, when we launched this product last year, I was able to go to a couple of cities and do deconstruction tastings where I would pour samples for everyone, and we'd we'd talk through the whiskies. Um, so I'm very sorry that you're not going to be able to do that with us, but please let us know what you're drinking. Um, hopefully, I mean, it's a Friday night, you're bound to be drinking something. So so let us know what you are having and how you're enjoying it as well um, and your recommendations. So I think what we'll do, Scott, is we'll start off with our first whiskey of the evening. Um, I'm just looking for my bottle. We're going to start off in style uh, by trying a Tomatin 1977. Um, so as I'm pouring this, I will, I guess we'll talk a little bit about the background of Decades, how this came about. This is actually Decades 2, um, as you'll see on the pack. Decades 2 there. Now, many of you might be lucky to remember the original Decades. And Scott, when we started at Tomatin, we started within about a year of each other. And uh, Dougie Campbell was still there, right? Dougie was still there. Dougie was working as a brand ambassador when I started in 2013. Yeah, so Dougie yeah. was still very much part of part of what we do. And what an incredible gentleman to learn from. He was, uh, I went to several whiskey tastings with him, and I also went to several, several whiskey shows with him. And to be able to tap into his knowledge and his experience, and that isn't just coming from how he made whiskey. It was also from the people that he met, the relationships that he had, an incredible, incredible chap. Yeah, uh, incredible guy. And Phil pops his head in every so often. Um, I've just noticed a little bit of sound issues back and forth there. So, uh, folks, I'll, I'll be open and honest with you. This is the first time we've run this. So if there is that, just bear with us a little bit. But hopefully it'll even itself out over the evening. So, yeah, Dougie, um, his story, for those of you that don't know, he started working at Tomatin, I believe it was in 1951 or something like that. And then 50 years later in 2011, um, to celebrate his 50th year of working at the distillery, and he had very much done every job. You know, he had been, he started off pouring tea when he was 15 for the people working in the office right through to master distiller. And then he semi-retired and came into a brand ambassador role. So to celebrate his 50th year at the company, um, he was asked to select whiskies from the five decades that he had worked at the distillery and that them together. And that was the original Tomatin Decades back in 2011. An incredible, incredible whiskey. But as Scott said, when we started at the company, Dougie was in more of an ambassadorial role. He was working part time and traveling a lot to Asia and Japan to do tastings. And as that was happening, um, we obviously needed a replacement from, and that was Graham Yunson, who will be joining me next Friday. So get your questions ready for Graham as well. Um, Chris, don't be nervous about opening your decades. It will reward you tenfold. Um, nothing worse than seeing a bottle like this closed on the shelf. Uh, but good warming up with a 12-year-old. Um, so uh, Graham starts working at the distillery as distillery manager and uh, did a lot to help us move towards focusing on a single malt brand rather than the bulk production that we had been known for in the past. And um, just last year, Graham, after uh, nine years, was promoted to the role of master distiller. So to celebrate that, we asked him to create his own version of Decades and also create something that is uh, thankful to all the staff that had worked at Tomatin over those decades and the incredible, incredible people that worked there. 
So he picked whiskey from five decades, of course, and that's what we have in decades two here. So um, it's an incredible liquid, and it's going to be what we finish off with at the end. We're going to talk through the individual decades as we're going. Um, but yeah, so um, we'll talk about the 77, but to give you a little bit of background, I'm going to talk about what was going on at the distillery um, in each of these decades. And um, But we need a bit of background before we get to the 70s. So Tomatin was opened in 1897. Uh, it was a very, very small distillery. And by 1906, it had fallen into bankruptcy. The, the 1890s were a big boom period in whiskey. And the early 1900s were a bust period. So Tomatin, like many distilleries at that time, went bankrupt. We were then bought by a couple of families from London. Uh, they were wine merchants and whiskey blenders and were incredibly successful in keeping the distillery alive throughout the First, Second World War through prohibition in the United States, which were damaging times. And then from the 1950s, uh, production starts to increase. It really starts to get booming. Um, so in 1954, Tomatin had two stills. It was very much the same as the distillery was in 1897. It could produce about a quarter of a million litres of alcohol every year. But within 20 years, by 1974, it had grown to become the biggest uh, producer of uh, malt whiskey in Scotland, second biggest producer of malt in the world. Um, if anyone knows what the biggest was, I'll give you bonus points. Um, I can't send you anything right now. I've got no sample bottles, so I'm going to have to deal with that. But if you can tell me, uh, kudos to you. Um, but in the 1970s, Tomatin was a mammoth, mammoth distillery, uh, 12 and a half million litres of alcohol a year. And we were almost operating a similar way to how a contract brewery will work. We would get an order from uh, the blenders of the time, the big uh, blending brands, and uh, we would fill uh, the casks that they required and then send them on to them. Um, and so that's the 1970s and 1970s was massive. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Scott. No, I mean, I think at the time as well, they were still producing a phenomenal spirit, which we've been so lucky to be able to tap into it to, to matter. Yeah. The, the whiskies that we've been privileged to sample in our roles just still continues to blow my mind. It's, we have just, there's, I, I'd never realised it until I started working at Tomatin seven, six years ago. It was the, I remember that first <laughs> time I went into a warehouse with Graham Munson and he opened up a, a cask from the 1970s. It just, oh, it's great whiskey. It really, really is. There's so much character, so much texture, so much depth. And just, and as well, I think as also there was some stoic people that worked at the distillery there. I mean, R Richard, our <laughs> head warehouseman, he still works at the distillery to this day. And did he start in 1974, I think, Scott? So. Yeah, yeah, he started. Uh, he, he he actually worked at the distillery for a couple of years, then went away, and then came back. Um, I, I don't think working in a bank was for him, so he's our warehouse manager still to this day. Yeah, and yeah, so and you've got some of the other other characters that we've been lucky to work with as well. Mm -hmm. That I mean, Ian Duthie, Charlie Edward. Over the time, yeah. these guys had some phenomenal, phenomenal stories, and uh, maybe we'll share some of those as as the drams start to go down. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Let's uh, <laughs> let's not get carried away. Uh, yeah, no. So the nineteen seventies was an incredible time, and like you say, some of the liquid from those uh, years is incredible as well. And particularly seventy six and seventy seven, they're two years that, for some reason, and it's not isolated to tomato. And there's a handful of distilleries that, if you get your hands on that, it is incredible, incredible liquid, um, and we can't really put a finger on it, but I've been lucky enough to try some of those liquids bottled at 10 years old, bottled at 12 years old, um, in old Caddenhead bottlings and things like that. And they are still um, incredible liquids, even in their youth. But I think where these liquids really come into their own is right now, because back in the 1970s, when we're producing 12 and a half million litres of pure alcohol, that's effectively 25 million bottles worth of whiskey. We're not going to be filling that into first fill bourbon barrels or first fill Oloroso sherry casks. A lot of the casks that were getting filled at that time were refill casks, casks that had been used once, twice before. And in their youth, those casks are not very active. 
um, just by their nature. It's the way they are. But over 30, 40 years of maturation, there's this huge amount of oxidation goes on in the cask. And Scott, I know you you like talking about that quite a lot and the flavours that that imparts. So. Uh, yeah, the, the the wonderful thing is, it's, it's that warehouse character that comes in. It's the oxygen. It's the the fact that the casks breathe. I think a lot of the time when people talk about single malt Scotch whiskey, people get wrapped up in whether it's a first fill Oloroso or a second fill, or a first fill Pedro Jimenez. Don't get me wrong. I there's a time and a place for those whiskies as well. But for me, the, what blew my mind was just the simplicity of this, and that's what, how Graham Munson explained it to me. I remember being in the warehouse very distinctly with him. First time he opened up one of the casks with the blue ends from 1976 and allowed me to sample from him. I thought this is the type of job that I could get used to. And but the, it's that warehouse character that those. I mean, the the pretentious wine term is in Rancio and Rancio's and and the, a word that I didn't know until I started working more closely with whiskey and with wine, but I, I can totally see that in there. You can almost, you, you smell that and you can almost smell like you're in warehouse six up at the distillery. It's fantastic. That's right. I mean, the vast majority of the whiskey that we have from the uh, 70s is in warehouse six. It's our traditional Dunnage warehouse and it has a slightly slower maturation, so keeps the strength in the casks there. Um, and there is a uh, it's almost, I always feel like walking into Warehouse 6, it's got that little bit of a uh, walking into a church type of thing. Um, I'm not a religious person, but there is an atmosphere when you walk into a building like that, or even when you walk into a big sports arena. Um, but when you walk into Warehouse 6, there's not only an atmosphere, there's a very, very clear smell uh, and aroma. And it's a little bit like, I've always, for anyone that's not had the opportunity to go into a Dunnage Warehouse, Think of being in like an old library or a secondhand bookshop and someone opens a tin of pineapples. It's that kind of mix of flavours. It's, 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 it's breathtaking. The, the, the very fact that in Scotland we produce tropical fruit flavours is... Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's somewhat tinged in irony, I must say. But yeah. the, the, the just, you, you get some mango, you get a little bit of guava coming through, and you go, "Oh, but why? Your mouth feels alive. It's gorgeous. Just the, the yeah. depth of character it creates." Yeah. So, actually, on that note, talk us through this whis whiskey. What are you smelling on this one, Scott? So, 1977 Tomatin. Again, I do get those lovely big oxidized notes that that, that rancio coming through. There's that burst of Tomatin warehouse. There's also this tiny little hints of the of that sort of the, the orchard fruit that was once there it almost is like it's dried out a little bit you know a little bit like yep. dry apples coming through but that just sort of combines in and then just at, that, at the very end of the nose i get a lovely little drop of that sort of passion fruit it almost i almost try and explain it to people like when you start to nose whiskey it almost trickles down into your mouth and it sort of prepares your taste buds for what you're about to enjoy it's a wonderful experience but even just uh, you hold this up to light, you can just see just there's there is so much body and structure into there, can't you? Yeah, it's it's a little bit. I find these quite interesting because these casks, by their nature, don't add a lot of color. But it's the same way like an oloroso sherry matures with that oxidation, and it's just the oxidizing that's created this color, which is incredible. Now, I've just popped a question up there from Kingswood, who's been uh, jumping in all week on Instagram. So, Philip, thank you for joining us again tonight. I said it the other night, and I'll say it again to, today. Um, Philip has an incredible uh, photography uh, page over on Instagram. Uh, so those of you that are watching, when you've got a bit of time, go and hit PS Kingswood Photography. Um, incredible little lifestyle shots. So go and have a look at that. Uh, Philip, your question, what's the temperature range year to year at the distillery? I would imagine the elevation would help with variation in temperature and breathing in the casks. Yeah, so Tomatin is very rarely a warm place. Uh, I think it was Wednesday last year that that happened. Um, but no, from, from a year, in the hottest years, we'll maybe hit 25 degrees for a couple of weeks in the summer. Um, and then it will go down to, when I lived there, I saw it at minus 10 once. That was extreme. Uh, it's been colder in the past. So as most of you will know, we're going through a little bit of global warming right now. Um, and when you see some of the photos from Tomatin in the 1970s, the snowfall was ridiculous. So the temperature is going to be so much colder. So 
I think as well as the temperature range year to year, the temperature range over the 40 years of this whiskey's lifestyle, uh, lifespan is going to have a, a huge impact. But um, in Warehouse 6, the temperature, very, very small fluctuations year round, uh, traditional um, earthen floor, thick, thick walls. Um, so you, it, it will maybe range, I don't know, Scott, if you, I've never taken a thermometer in, but I've, I've never really felt it going above five degrees in there. Yeah, I think I think it would be very rare for it to go above seven, eight degrees, I would say, and drop down below four degrees Celsius. So it's, it's never going to be too warm. It's never going to be too cold. When I was yeah. up at the distillery a couple of weeks ago, it was quite cold outside, and when you walk in, it felt warm. So, well, warmer certainly, but yeah. um, there there isn't a great fluctuation, and that's what allows Scotch whisky to mature for so long. That that in our climate, there's natural humidity. I think there's a question that's come up there from Krish Kumar. So, yep. we'll probably that in terms of the humidity, Scotland has natural humidity uh, from ranging from the rainfall coming in from the west coast, and also with the wind taking it down it means that our temperatures don't get too hot and too cold and it's what allows us to mature whiskey for such a long time to create such great flavors yeah and I don't know there. we are third fourth highest distillery in scotland um we're not at that point where atmospheric pressure becomes an incredible thing philip i know you're over in canada i remember a couple of years ago i was landing in uh, i think i was in calgary and I saw on the plane that the elevation on the tarmac was 1,500, 2,000 metres above sea level. And I was trying to tell people in the tastings that evening that 300 metres above sea level was really, really high. But I think it was that elevation's at the uh, the bottom of your lakes over there. So, But what it does mean for us is that our evaporative losses year on year are slightly smaller than the Scottish average. So on average, year to year, we'll lose about 2%, but at Tomatin, it's between 1% and 1.5%. So it means that we can keep uh, liquids like this for just that little bit longer. Um, and on that point, um, there, I think that when you, you create a product like this, Decades is a non-age statement product. Now, when you open up the pack, um, there is a bit more information about the years that have been used. Um, but when you see something like this, the the skeptic amongst us would um, would question how much of this old liquid has actually gone into this product. 24% um, of what is in this product is from the 1970s. So it's almost a quarter of the liquid from the 1970s. And it's not just 1977. We've got a couple of casks from 1973 and a cask from 1975 as well. So this is an incredible opportunity to try liquid that would otherwise cost upwards of £3,000 in uh, a different format and, and get that experience. Um, I'm just going to pick up on a question from Gregor there as well. Uh, again, Gregor's been jumping in as much as he can this week. Last night he had a, a blind tasting over with Roya Aquavite, which was a lot of fun. Um, uh, one of the whiskies that was coming in lower place, uh, there was a suggestion that it might be Legacy. And I messaged Gregor to say, I, I certainly hope it's not Legacy. And it wasn't, so we got off the hook quite well there, um, because Legacy often does very well in these blind tastings. Gregor, your question tonight, and I hope to see many from you because they're always good. For Geekery, what makes a dunnage a dunnage versus a racked a warehouse or a store? So the term done, um, I don't know if you can see that photo behind myself and Scott there. I might actually bring us off the screen so that you can see that a little bit. So if we do. That removes my microphone as well. That's a Dunnage warehouse there. And the casks are stored maybe two, at most three high, very, very traditional style. Those little bars that run in between the casks, they are called duns. So that's where the name comes from. But a Dunnage warehouse is very much these casks that are stored on their own weight. Um, so it's cask above cask above cask, um, typically with earth, earth and floor, and typically with thick stone walls. So very, very traditional. Rack houses, uh, as you have over in the States, racked warehouses, we call them here, will have 11 casks high on steel racks. Um, this, there's still incredible whiskey in those warehouses, but they're just a, a more modern way of uh, maturing whiskey, especially as you get into the 1970s. And like I say, if you look at Tomatin, 
250,000 litres a year in the 1890s, uh, 12 and a half million litres a year in the 1970s. We needed much more warehouse uh, and we needed it to take less land. Uh, so that's why these racked warehouse became uh, popular. And today, palletized warehouses are popular as well. So, um, yeah, so this is just an incredible whiskey, Scott. Yeah, yeah, a gorgeous whiskey. Let's have a little dram. Cheers. Cheers to everyone that's watching as well. It's Langevin. Hopefully you're enjoying your drams at home and one day we can share something like this with you as well. Cheers. Yeah. Lance Cruz is in. Lance, or as, as we like to call him, double tall for the way that he orders Tomat in 14-year-old. Uh, does your name change to Scott when you go to work for Tomatin? No, you have to be called Scott to get a job there. Um, that's the <laughs> At one stage there was five, I think, was there? Did we, did we reached five Scots? There was a lot, yeah. It, it seems to be that if you're called Scott Graham or Stephen, you're you're sorted for a job. <laughs> and also, if you go to the distillery uh, and you want to speak to someone, someone just ask for Scott, Stephen, or Graham, and one of us is bound to be there. So back to the 1977, Scott. What do you really in what 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 do you envisage? What's your first memory of drinking older Tomatin or older whiskey in general? Older Tomatin, yeah, I think it was. I mean. A very very similar um, sort of way in as you in that when we started at Tomatin and it still is a very very small company by comparison to others but when we started at Tomatin the whole sales and marketing team amounted to five people in an office and there was no um, no real nosing panel or blending team it was the distillery manager making the products and we were very lucky that he would bring them to us and say, here, what do you think of that? Or here, write some tasting notes. And it just comes one day that you're on front of you as a, a sample of tomatin from the 1970s. And you're like, this is incredible. This is outrageous that we get to drink this stuff. You know, uh, I, I just remember that moment of this is this is impressive. Not a lot of people get to do this and not a, a lot fewer people get to do this and make money whilst doing it, which is a, a nice part of the job. So, yeah, that's good. It's, it's, I think it's I think it's lovely for us that we have such good experiences at work. I yeah. I, I always think we're so fortunate for what we've been able to what we're able to taste and where we're able to go and who we're able to meet. It's uh, I, I see some of the names coming down the right hand side, and a few of them we've bumped into at festivals and at tastings over the years. And it's it's amazing when people keep on coming back to come. Um, listen to us talk about tomatin and just to share their experiences as well really really nice big time big time um stuart gillespie had the pleasure of tasting tomatin decades to at hamden and bought a bottle how does it differ from the first one well that's a that's a good question and it's it's hard to really um to know because when i came into the distillery i was still a student and I didn't buy a bottle of the original Decades, which is one of the biggest regrets I probably have in my life. Um, and we have very few of them in the archive now because it was such a popular product. So we've not really had the chance to sit down and go nose for nose on them. Um, the original Decades had whiskey from 67 up to 2005. This one has uh, 73 through to 2013. Um, but I think what both of them do very, very well is give a great, almost cross-section of the flavours that you'll find at Tomatin. Uh, both of these products are incredibly, incredibly complex. Uh, you can sit for hours with your nose in the glass just picking apart the flavours of them both. Um, but in terms of like for like, flavour for flavour, unfortunately, I'm not in the position to tell you, but maybe if you've got a couple of bottles, um, I'll pop down and see you and we can we can figure it out together. I I mean, I, I can jump in there because I have tasted decades relatively recently. I've tasted it in the last in the last year, I would say, and I nice. remember from as well. There's a, there's a tiny little peated note in in decades because we did use some peated stock. Yeah. Um, I think for the 2005. So there, there's there's definitely differences. You still had a huge proportion of those lovely big tropical fruit notes. So yeah. as well, the, the whiskey from the nine from 1967 where. We're so lucky to still have a little drop of that left that we've been able yeah. to share gradually. That it, there's there's certain there's certain years there's certain vintages from Tomatin where 
they just really excelled themselves and we're so lucky to have little pockets of stock left over for us to be able to sample this far on in the future. Absolutely. And to be able to use them in a product like this, a lot of distilleries are in the position where if they have a cask from the 1970s, that's the, that's the only cask. Um, now, by no means is this stuff endless, but being able to use it in this kind of format is a great, great thing for us. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I realise that we're already half an hour in and we've only had one whiskey, so we should move on to number two, eh? <laughs> Definitely. A little, yeah. a little bit of sherry back into ourselves. Yeah, so the second whiskey we're going to have, uh, my lovely sample bottle here. Uh, you know, well done. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, got you eat, that's it. Is, oh, great noise. Is from 1988. So if you had told someone at Tomat and Distillery in the late 1970s that within a handful of years the company would be bankrupt, they would have laughed you out of the room. Um, our former managing director Bob Anderson retired last year and when he retired we were going through some of the uh, paperwork that he had and one of the things that he had was plans from 1977 the year we've just tried for even more warehousing than was actually built so the 70s were a time of huge optimism but then the 1980s came and um, that was a bad time for the whiskey industry generally um, oil prices rise there's a global recession and flavors change. The consumer starts to look for um, for white spirits, for vodkas and, uh, and gins. Um, whiskey all of a sudden becomes the drink that your dad or your grandfather drunk and the marketing didn't really keep up. But we were far more disconnected with the market than we are today. In the 1980s, there was no brand ambassadors. There was no distillery visitor centers. So we weren't able to really quickly react to the market in the way that I hope we would be uh, in the modern times. So we kept producing whiskey and kept producing whiskey. Now, the big problem for Tomatin was we didn't really have a brand of our own. We've been releasing single malt uh, since the 1950s, but really, really small, small volumes. And the companies that we were supplying uh, started buying their own distilleries. Uh, so they no longer needed a third party supplier. So in 1984, for the second time in its history, Tomatin went bankrupt. Um, and with that came real a couple of years of real hardship. Uh, but in, uh, in 1985, we were bought by the company that still owns us today, a company called Takara Shutsu. Uh, who are a Japanese shochu manufacturer. And at the time, um, they were importing a lot of our spirit to use in their Japanese whiskey. Now, you might be questioning that. Um, something to say right now is that a lot of Japanese whiskey strictly isn't Japanese. Um, I'll let you do your own research into that. But back in the 1980s, Takara were producing a whiskey called King Whiskey. And a lot of tomato went into it. So they made the decision that rather than lose the supply of whiskey, they would buy the distillery. Um, so they did. And what we've been really grateful for is that we still have full autonomy from them. We are one of the few distilleries in Scotland to have our head offices at the distillery. Um, we, we have full control over what we bottle, when we bottle it, what we produce, when we produce it, how we produce it. So that's a great, great thing for us. And it's meant that we still have a small amount of liquid from the 1980s. So um, I'll be open right now and tell you that the 1988 that we're going to try here is the smallest um, component in decades. And that's purely because not a lot of liquid was made in that decade. Uh, so 9% of the final recipe comes from 1988. And this has been finished for three years in first fill Oloroso sherry casks. So, uh, Scott, I don't know if you want to talk us through this. Yeah, I mean, just right right on that nose, though, you did get that lovely burst of Oloroso sherry. Oloroso sherry, much like the 1977 that we just sampled previously, has those beautiful oxidised notes as well. You can almost taste that. You can taste that interaction between the Spanish warehouse, the tunnel area, the, and the just everything that you've done in the bodega, should I say, and everything that interacts inside there in the glass. And then that starts to just really sort of come through at the very top note of the whiskey. But then when you go underneath, you get that, you get those lovely 
again, a little bit of orchard fruit, but there's a lovely little bit of, almost like a little bit of leather that comes in there, a little bit of um, yeah. dried fruit as well comes in. It's just, just creates a much more, there's a much more powerful nose, which I, I really enjoy. I think I think powerful is a great word for this because uh, I mean the, f the first point is what a contrast from the nineteen seventy seven. The nineteen seventy seven is this light um, tropical sort of whiskey, and then we get probably the heaviest component in decades there. And powerful is a great word for this because I think if I was to have this as a tomato and single malt in and of itself, I struggle a little bit to pick up the tomato and character that light citrus apple rhubarb flavor and the casks have been really powerful there which makes it an incredible ingredient for a liquid like this um, because it can add a bit of depth that we wouldn't otherwise have exactly but then that's that's the joy of using casks and that's the joy of even not just of decades too but also of the tomato and core range there's just such a wide variety of cask influence of age influence it all comes together which we can almost yeah. pick apart and create a whiskey that's that's interesting for various different consumers i think i think it's important that everybody always remembers that their palate's different i you know what what i taste what you taste is, is probably going to be slightly different although i do know from when we do our tasting notes together that sometimes we are, they, they are they're, they're they are quite similar um, yes. Yeah. Great minds think alike. Is that what they say, Scott? That's what they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. So you're right. I mean, I think that is a key, key point. A lot of the time, people come up to us um, at whiskey festivals, and they'll be holding uh, a book uh, written about whiskey by one man, um, who will remain nameless. Um, and I, I often wonder why are you looking at somebody else's opinion of a whiskey? Because it's going to be totally different from what you think of it. And it's also going to sway your opinion as well. Um, so even when I get asked by people what's my favourite, I'll tell them why I like each whiskey and what's great about each whiskey and then go, what, what one appeals to you? And I think that's a great way of introducing people to our uh, our liquids. Exactly, exactly. So when you're... When you're saying that, what was your what was your eureka moment in discovering flavour? I mean, uh, uh, just one moment speaks springs to mind with me. Can you remember the first time that you were able to move away from it just being whiskey and something you enjoy to really sort of understanding a little bit more about what was in your glass? Yeah, there, there is a standout moment for that because so I started working at Tomatin when I was 21 years old. I was quite young. And uh, in the UK, the drinking age is, of course, 18, but very, very few 18-year-olds go out and have a, a whiskey, you know. So um, when I started working at the distillery, I was poured a dram of Tomatin 12-year-old, and I was asked, what, what did I think? And I was like, yeah, it's whiskey, you know. Um, I, I didn't have much knowledge of whiskey at that time, so I, I took it upon myself to start going to tastings. And... We're, we're lucky that in Inverness you do get quite a few tastings. Um, at the time it was by the whiskey shop. And we, we get spoiled in Inverness because we are in the heart of whiskey making country. So the first whiskey tasting I went to was a, a Bal Blair tasting um, with John McDonald, the distillery manager from Bal Blair. Um, and if I'm being honest, at the time I didn't really realize how, um, how an incredible an opportunity that was you know it's only when I've gone traveling around the world and I see how rare it is for a distillery manager to come and do a tasting that I realized how fortunate I was to have that so we went through um, the Bal Blair range and at that time it was when it was still the vintages and there was that real moment of we've jumped from a bourbon barrel to a sherry cask a fully matured bourbon barrel to a fully matured sherry cask and I was like wow these are massively different flavors. These are totally different. I didn't realize, I, I think what it, it did for me was that within one range, within two whiskeys, there was such a massive variety. And then if you apply that to 140 odd distilleries that we now have, I think that's what stayed with me is, and I think it's the reason that for me, Scotch whiskey is the greatest spirit in the world is the, 
it covers the whole flavor spectrum from light, citrusy, um, floral, all the way through to that massively heavy, peaty, oily flavors and everything in between. Uh, I think that's why whiskey is so great. I don't know, you, you mentioned that you've got uh, an experience, maybe a similar oh, yeah. one. I just I just remember drinking a, a, a jam of Royal Loch Nagar uh, when I worked in as a tour guide as a student, and I went, oh, that smells like toffees, and well, that smells like apples, so that smells like toffee apples, and it was that moment where I went, oh, I sort of begin to understand a little bit more about where the flavour comes from, and uh, but still at this time, it's amazing when you put ten people in a room, how yeah. different yeah. the opinions can be, and I think that's what's so important that everybody remembers is that it's your opinion that and yeah. that's the most yeah. important thing so come in and sample these whiskies as often as you can yeah and i, I think um, as your, your opinion is formed by your experience and so if i smell a uh, peated whiskey uh, very often the flavor note that comes to mind is either campfire or heather burning so every year in scotland we burn the heather on the hills to regenerate the grassland now if you're someone that's lived in london all your life you're never going to have that experience. You're not going to have that in your head. So it will very often smell like the underground or something like that, or or a chimney. So um, I think not only your opinion, but also the way you can verbalise what you're tasting is quite important. Totally, yeah. I mean, my, mine's maybe a little bit more simplistic. We have a, a chain of bakeries up here called Harry Gow's, and there's a lot of a lot of the flavours in there that will that will link into various things, and that's what connects in my head. Is it, is it an app, apple turnover or a cinnamon swirl? <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's I, 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 the I link the that tastes like a dream ring. Um, <laughs> let's try and make that a reality. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. some creamy buttery bourbon finishes coming up. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're digressing. This is the problem. Right back to the 1988. Yeah. All the Rosso. Yeah. So nose there, like you say, is that big, big, powerful whiskey. But what's interesting for me, obviously, I've never uh, tried to eat leather. But I think if I had, that's the sort of experience that it would be. It is that it's quite drying. It's quite polished. It's it's powerful. Yeah, no, exactly. There's some gorgeous notes, and even when you taste it, there is that. There's that. That I know that earthiness, that leatheriness that comes through. Um, yeah. But the, the tannins just stay with you for so long. It's just I can almost feel my face warming up a little bit. This would be a wonderful whiskey. You know, if you were to, there's Crispy. He loves an apple turnover. Good lad, Crispy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no, it's but there's just so much. Big, there's so much body. There's so much depth, but it also. It creates that lovely, long-lasting finish. You know, just the same as what we'd get into Matt an eighteen-year-old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's almost like um, to Matt an eighteen-year-old turned up to eleven. It's like to Matt an eighteen-year-old on steroids in its most powerful form. Exactly. No, it's uh, just yeah. I and I I love that. There is there is a little bit underneath it all. You have that little bit of. Um, of the tropical fruits that are starting to form. You know, you just taste that just before that the sherry comes through, you have yeah. that almost like a moment of tropical fruit that comes in, which you, you see where it could have gone had it been in a, in, in a traditional it, Scotch oak cast. If it had been left without the food. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's, um, but you've got to search for that. You've got to know that that is something that can be in a tomato before you'll find that. So, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Privileged so, position uh, we come from. Shall we move on to the 1990s? Yeah, let's move on to the 1990s. We, the 1980s was obviously the best decade because that was when I was born. So <laughs> I knew you were going to get that in there. But I, I also know that this is one of your favourite styles of whiskey, so I'm quite comfortable in all <laughs> You know as well as I do that the 90s yeah. are better than the 80s. I, I was told not to swear, so I better stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's wait till eight o'clock at least, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Getting yeah. fired. Watershed. <laughs> yeah. No, the 1990s is uh, was obviously a time of change at Tamatin as well. You know, that yeah, was when a, a lot of, sort of reassurance in the local area. You know, trying mm -hmm. to get a get a footing back in. There was obviously a bit of to and froing that happened at the distillery, but. A huge amount of the staff that work at the distillery eh, started in the 1990s, didn't they? 
Yeah, big time. I mean, the 1990s for the industry as a whole, taking that wider look, was still a, a, a very difficult time. There was a lot of distilleries still closing into the 1990s. Um, and you could probably say that the opening of Aaron in 1995 was kind of that tipping point. Um, I'm sure people thought they were mental at that time for doing such a thing, but um, that kind of signaled a little bit of change. And it was around about the same time for us. So still right through to that point, our business is um, supplying whiskey to other producers in much smaller volumes than we had been in the 70s, for, of course. Um, just to go back, uh, I mentioned that if uh, if if anyone got the biggest distillery in the world, they would get um, some bonus points. Now, Urban Booze gave it a crack with Jack Daniels. Um, nope, and nobody else got it. It was Hakushu in Japan, biggest distillery in the world at that time. Um, but and anyway, that's just... Uh, geeky knowledge there. Um, but yeah, going into the 1990s, um, we're still a supplier to the blended whiskey industry, but we get a great, great opportunity in 1996. And that is when uh, the company that we now know as Diageo is formed. And they were offloading some of the brands from the merger that they had had and had made the decision that the premium blended whiskey that they would focus on is Johnny Walker. And they've done a great job of it. But it meant that a brand called The Antiquary became available. So uh, Tomatin Distillery took the opportunity and bought The Antiquary brand, which is still available to this day. But I think what that was for us was our first foray into selling bottled goods. Um, we had Big Tea as a blended scotch before that, but... Um, as as has always been the case, Big T is a price fighter. It's a it's a standard uh, shelf blend, but Antiquary was something a little bit different, um, and that's when we first started exporting, setting up distribution, uh, and all of these sort of challenges. And it's very much laid the groundwork for what Tomatin was to become in the thousands and uh, the twenty ten in, in the last decade. And I think you're right. Probably the biggest thing for Tomatin in the 1990s is it started employing people again. And a lot of the guys that work there today, like uh, Rob Nixon and stuff like that, they, they started at that time. Um, and they, they can tell a lot of stories from how, even in the last 30 years, the distillery's changed. Exactly, exactly. And just from nosing this whiskey as well, they were making great spirit as well. Yeah, <laughs> so that's another thing as well. So, the 1990s is also when there's, because we've got a brand now that is got our name behind it, we start spending a little bit more money on casks. Now, 1990s is around about the time where people start to sit back and go, casks are maybe a little bit more important than we thought they were. Up until now, we thought it was just the water that made the difference, but it turns out that these pieces of oak can have a really significant impact. Um, so in the 1990s, we started buying a much higher quality of oak than we had in the past. And in 1995, we bought a parcel of first fill bourbon barrels. And that's what's been used in the decades here. This is actually the biggest component in decades. Uh, it's 26% of the recipe. So if you're doing your maths up until, uh, until now, uh, you'll know that 60% the, of the liquid in this product is over 25 years old. So we've not been tight, tight here. We've put some good juice in here. Um, but yeah, fully matured for 25 years in first full bourbon barrels. So it's a big bomb. You do. You just get that lovely big whiff of bourbon coming through, that influence of the that the Virgin American oak casks has had on the, on the corn spirit in America. There is yep. a little bit of that in the, the sitting there that, when you you know when you open a bottle of bourbon and you get that those lovely aromas coming out, there's a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of vanilla, or not just a little bit of vanilla, a lot yeah. of vanilla. And it's yeah, just yeah. we hear the term uh, cherry bomb a lot. I think this would be um, a bourbon bomb. A bourbon bomb. Um, if you are a bourbon drinker, if you like bourbon, this liquid right here is for you, one hundred percent. Yeah. So cheers. Cheers. Yeah, I, you've been a little bit quiet recently. What are you drinking tonight? What are you enjoying? What are you sipping along with? Um, to let us know. Let, let us know what you're tasting. Exactly. I mean, as well. Also, let us know what you're 
define what your first experience, first experiences are with whiskey. We'd love to know a little bit more about what you get up to and how you're able to enjoy whiskey. What was your first moment? It's for me. There's there's been so many memories across the whole time that it's it's very difficult to define. What was your first ever whiskey experience? Full stop. Oh, <laughs> well, I I won a bottle of Talisker ten year old in the Isle of Skye Highland Games because I was recruited into the tug of war team that year and I think there was, there was four teams and the winning team won a, a bottle of Talisker 10 year old and then we proceeded to a, travel around Portree and a, with a bottle of Talisker 10 year old in the cup. Um, I won't say how old I was because I certainly wasn't 18 at the time but um, that, was my, that, that was my first um, single malt experience certainly. Um, yeah. I've maybe sampled some uh, some whiskey from that uh, before then. I think we were slightly younger when we went to pubs in Scotland for a little while. Not anymore, though. Yeah. yeah. What about you? What was your first ever uh, experience with whiskey? Similar sort of, of um, young and dumb moment, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you'll know this name, uh, so I'll give a wee shout out to Jake Eaglesham. Um, oh, yeah. We were in Inver Gordon one night. It was when the Souter Bar was still open. And we were walking from the Souter to the Cali Bar, two very Scottish sounding pub names. So we walk from the Souter to the Caledonian and we're halfway there and Jake stops the group of four of us and uh, pulls a bottle of Old Inverness uh, out of his jacket. And he never arrived at the pub with that bottle. So I think he still owes the Souter a little bit of money. He might be one of the reasons they went out of business, but he pulls this bottle of whiskey out his pocket and goes, here, try some. Odin Reness is, a, again, a, a very, very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a blend of probably a certain level of repute. Um, but he passes it to me and I take a swig from the bottle. And in that moment, I swore that I would never drink whiskey again. So my three mates have a sip and then the bottle comes back to me. And I, uh, I, I kind of went against my vow almost immediately and the second sip wasn't so bad, and the third was certainly a lot better. So, um, I, th I think it was one of those moments where you realise that whiskey, um, like most drinks, is a very, very social thing. Um, exactly. And I, I definitely yeah. would say it's one of the reasons that I, I pursued a career in whiskey. But it's definitely a moment that I'll, I'll remember. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a lot of the time with whiskey. It's the people that you were drinking with, the the place that you were. It's not just the whiskey that you're drinking. Yeah. Although it does help to add to that sort of that moment, if you can pair the whiskey with the moment, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I've just seen a uh, EJ Cookie there. I'll bring this up. One of the reasons I love Legacy is the barrels that they're aged in Dwalkas in the, in the US. So those of you that were on uh, Instagram last night, I, I did a big, um, I guess you could call it a feature on Legacy and talking about the casks. Um, if the nineteen eighty eight is a supercharged version of our Tomat and 18 year old, then this 1995 is a supercharged version of Legacy. I think that would be pretty fair to say, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, there's, there's, um, because of the Virgin Oak influence and Legacy, we're almost able to impart some of those big flavors that bourbon drinkers are more accustomed to, that bartenders love all across the world into Dualcus in the States and Legacy in the rest of the world. Um, and that's exactly what I'm tasting there in the 1995, the first full X bourbon. And I, I think when we get on to the final decades too, it's actually a hugely prominent note as well that you, that mm. you find. It's definitely the biggest component part. Um, yeah. I think because the, when you go back to the 80s, it's, it's the smallest component, but it's such a big flavor that the influence is still there. But the, the 1990s definitely does jump out a bit. And, all tomatin from the 1990s that I've tried certainly has been quite bold and quite powerful. Um, even if you compare that spirit to before and after, and um, it this bourbon cask is no way different from that. It, it definitely jumps out. Keith Masson, good to see you in. Uh, he's on Lafroy tonight. We'll give the thumbs down for that. Uh, no, good whiskey. Uh, <laughs> we've inspired him to set up a Friday night video tasting session with pals until we can get back to the pub. Fantastic. Good. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do that tomorrow with some mates. Um, I think now we are almost forced to learn how to use technology. 
And um, I think it's also quite good as well. I mean, I, I, Scott, I'm sure you're in the same position that you've got friends living around the world. And until now, we probably didn't think of having a hangout online, just drinking with buddies. We probably waited till they got home at Christmas and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, there, there is a silver lining to all this, I would I would say. And I think it is the, the fact that the robots are taking over and uh, <laughs> but for the best. Uh, well, no, it's, it's, it has obviously been a learning curve. I think we've within our own group because none of, no, we don't all work from home normally. That uh, video conferencing isn't something that we've been used to. Uh, no. um, I think I think we're we're slowly starting to get there, and things uh, events like this certainly help. Now yeah, I think we, we should move on to the to this this millennium, Scott. Yeah, uh, just before we go on, I think. Uh, it was great. We, we've been working from home all week, and yesterday I actually uh, got dressed, which was good. So. <laughs> and don't I, like, I, I just got a jumper on tonight. That's all. Uh, yeah, we're moving into the the millennials. You're right. You're right. So probably the biggest jump in age is um, from the 1995 that we've just drunk to the 2009 that we're going to drink now. The 1980s and the 1990s were all from the same year in decades. But like the 1970s, uh, we've used two uh, ages from the thousands. We've used 2000 and 2009. Um, and the common theme among, amongst them is the cask type. So into the thousands, we really start to start to experiment a little bit more with casks. We, we not only look at the, the quality, but we also look at what can we do a little bit differently? And in uh, 2009, we bought a parcel of um, Richard Verdeo wine casks. We filled some new make spirit into it, and we also filled some spirit from 2000 that had been maturing in hogsheads to finish in those casks. And that's what's been used here. Now, myself and Scott were talking before we went live about how we're actually very lucky at Tomat and, and I bang on about this a lot, so uh, sorry if this is a repeat for any of you. We're very lucky to have our own cooperage at the distillery, and that means that we can work with suppliers from around the world. Now, French virgin oak casks are incredibly expensive, and and for obvious reasons. They're required by the wine industry. Um, they're required by the spirits industry. Cognac, for example, we'll use some of those. Um, but there's another way of getting those casks. And so what we've done here is we've sourced them from a Verdeo producer, a Spanish wine maker um, called um, Bellandrad and Lurton. Beautiful Verdeo producer. Um, I'm just seeing my wife's posting in here, so I'm going to see what she's chatting about. Ah, uh, very funny. <laughs> Mr. Scott Adamson has told me everything I know about whiskey, which isn't much. Uh, he's still trying his hardest to get me on board with whiskey and having little success <laughs> doing great. Oh, well, that's a good show of support. Um, I actually got her on whiskey sours the other night, which was good. Um, so we get these casks, and we're not looking for a wine influence from those casks. Um, from experience at, with tomato and spirit, white wine doesn't work so well. I think we tried some, and it ended up having to go in a blend before. Um, Hopefully somebody else's blend. <laughs> but what we've done here is we have recharred the casks. And the reason for that is it strips away the wine flavor and it allows us to access the oak. And it almost works like uh, virgin oak casks. So this is a very, very good way of getting virgin French oak flavors into our whiskey. Yeah, I think in some of our... Uh, viewers in the US may have remembered, and in Canada may have remembered, it was a 12-year-old French oak expression. So that French oak had the, these lovely, I think it was five years it was finished in French oak for, had these lovely big, it was almost more intense than a than, than bourbon cast in terms of the vanilla. They, we, we, it was more of that sort of butteriness that came through, like, you know, we have tablet in Scotland or vanilla fudge and the rest of the world and just how it fills your mouth with this lovely, lovely big texture and mouthfeel that just sort of envelops across the whole palate. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's yes. from European versus American oak. American oak adds a, a huge amount of flavour, a huge amount of sweetness, the vanillas, the coconuts. 
but where European oak pips it is on the mouthfeel. Um, so there's definitely a lot of flavour here. Huge amount of spice, um, cinnamon, cardamom, ginger, um, totally. even dried fruit from the oak itself. But then the taste is unbelievable. And the there's mouthfeel. A, of, a lovely little burst of sweetness in there as well, which I, I can't actually remember drinking this the last time, but I, that's, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Just the, that, that sweetness just really helps. And I think as well, that would be something that would be beautiful to pair with some desserts. You know, maybe some uh, like a little bit of fruit dessert, fruit and cream dessert, something like that. That's what that's what springs to mind when everyone knows that. Big time. I mean, it's not quite as drying as the... There's a dryness there. It's not quite as drying as the Oloroso sherry cask. So it does work well in that sort of food pains. Um, Have you had any... What's your favourite tomato and food pairing, Scott? Um, not there. Didn't know that one was going. I'll be I'll be honest with you. I am not the biggest fan of whiskey dinners. Uh, I can see a time and a place for them, but nine times out of ten, if I'm going to have a dinner, I'd prefer to have a glass of wine and finish off with a whiskey. Maybe even start with a whiskey. Uh, a light whiskey is an aperitif. What I quite like whiskey with is snacks. A little. Mm -hmm here and there. Um, Legacy is fantastic with toffee popcorn, it turns out. Um, <laughs> we, we were doing a couple of nosings the other week there, and I think one that we, we nailed quite well was um, the tomato and 18-year-old with like cured meats, um, yeah. so like jerkies and things like that, blue cheeses. Uh, I think that's where whiskey and food works well together. The reason I think that I don't enjoy whiskey dinners so much is that Whiskey is very powerful. If you're going to have a meal with it, it's also got to be very powerful. If you're doing three courses and it's all very, very big, big flavours, your mouth just gets tired by the end of it. But little um, like cheese, cured meats, um, sweet toffees, small desserts with whiskey is a great way to drink. Dark chocolate with uh, tomato and 18 year old. It's one of those ones you hear it a lot. Take a little bite of really, really dark chocolate, let it melt on your tongue, and then have some tomato and 18 year old. I think that's probably maybe not my favorite, but definitely the one that stands out as something that I will always tell people to try. Yeah, that's it. I think the, the, the one time that I remember it was uh, we were sitting down, we had a meal in Italy, um, and we were finishing with tiramisu. We had a 15-year-old travel retail expression that had been finished just in bourbon casks. And just the, I just, the, the cream and the cream just really worked well together. Uh, but that little bit of coffee offset the sweetness in the bourbon casks. And I was just, I, I always remember that moment going, yeah, that does pair incredibly, incredibly well. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the, the gentleman that was hosting myself and Maurizio at the time was, uh, just put me on the spot and said, and pair one of your whiskeys with this dessert so <laughs> <laughs> off i went and <laughs> i managed no to nail it. it was a bit of a fluke if i'm going to be honest <laughs> but, uh, was, I, I love that you you're now you've made that pairing and you're also saying it was the best one you ever had no no ego in there at all <laughs> <laughs> naturally <laughs> yeah. i think so alistair much uh who we work with there's he's our uk sales director um the 15 year old that we have in travel retail used to be part of our core range and it's not necessarily specific to that whiskey itself but that style of a combination of first and second filled bourbon barrels tomatin with spicy food with like a thai red curry is unbelievable that is just the citrus and the spice together is stunning so uh, if you get a chance to try that definitely no I look forward to it. I think we'll have to get creative in the kitchen over the, the coming few weeks. So Yeah, it's forward. going to be a little bit like, uh, it's going to start getting like episodes of Ready, Steady, Cook. <laughs> that, which is now back in your television. No. <laughs> it's also in the mirror now as well. I've bought uh, some carrots and some chocolate. What can we make? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Technology's come a long way, Scott. So, yeah. uh, What do you think of this one? Uh, the the Verdeo is absolutely beautiful. I mean, yeah. just that, like I said, that sweetness coming through. You mentioned the spices coming in, and those sweet and spice are always going to be enjoyable combinations. Um, just, I think that's a, it's a whiskey that just continues to open up more and more. 
I, I poured my whiskey about an hour before we started the presentation, and I think just that little bit of time in the glass really helped it as well. Yep. Just opened it up because obviously I've tasted it before, but then really now when you're sitting there analysing it in comparison with what we've had already, it's it's a lovely little step change, and you can see how it's going to complement the previous three whiskies as well. Now, I, this is this is something I wanted to ask you about actually because. Adding water, not adding water to a whiskey. Everything that we're trying tonight, except from the final product, is at cask strength. Um, and we've started off in the 70s at about 42%. We're now getting up there. We're getting into high 70s in 2009. And my advice to people with tomatin specifically, especially when it's in a sherry or a pork cask, has always been give it 10 minutes before you add a drop of water because I find a huge amount of the flavor opens up with oxygen, with time. Um, now we're getting into the, the the high strengths now, and I've poured mine directly from the bottle, but totally. I remember correctly, like you being at a tasting where it had been poured for hours, and you're right, this opens up massively with time, and I would say that it doesn't, it doesn't favor water so well, this one. No, I mean... <sighs> I, I haven't added water to the, the first three whiskies, but I'll add a little drop of water just to this just now, doing this off screen, excuse me. But, I mean, in there as well, I find that the water does obviously give a little bit more of the flavour coming through. It just opens up a little bit more of that that spice, but it almost tones down the spice. And I, I'm someone that loves big flavor and I love big food. Like, it's just, I find that with that little drop of water, perhaps you taste more of those spices. So you taste a little bit more of the ginger, you taste a little bit more of the cardamom, a little bit more um, of the cinnamon, but it doesn't have that impact that it does altogether. That's, that would be my way of describing it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, I guess the word that I would use is muted. Um, yeah, but more defined at the same time, and I can see yeah. why. <laughs> I, I can see why. I, you can tell I we're can see why people do have water. <laughs> yeah. Now I just saw there the uh, Mr. Yunsen's in, so best behaviour. Uh, Graham Yunsen, master distiller at Tomatin, is tagged along, and uh, in terms of uh, food pairings, he said scallops with anything. Um, so that's that's good advice. Um, those of you that are in right now, Graham's going to be joining me next week. We're going to be starting at nine o'clock. Scott's got an earlier bedtime than most people, so we've had to come early tonight. I, th I think we both realised that this could last quite a while tonight, so we can start early. Uh, but yeah, Graham's going to be in the chat next week. Um, we're going to be talking probably about limited editions. Uh, Gregor's already asked a belter of a question for him, but keep the questions coming in all week and we'll we'll send them to Graham uh, next week. So, um, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So let's move on to the, la yep. the, la the previous decade that we're in just now, the 2010s. Have we decided what we're going to, what, what that's, is it the 10s? Is that what they're called, that decade? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, it must be the tens. Because what I, was I the got in, cousins was people. The, the noughties were the zero zeros, weren't they? That, yeah. was the, that was called the noughties. Yeah. But it must be the tens after that. Does anybody know what that was called? Probably, yeah. Uh, it's probably got a better name than the twenties, the way it's going right now. But <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's so true. We're, we're going into the tens and we're going into the youngest whiskey. Now, what's quite interesting about this was. Um, when we released this product, it was late last year, and I started doing these tastings down in London with with Chris, who's in the chat, and uh, we were about two, three weeks till the end of the year, and I made the quite harrowing point that we're actually coming to the end of the decade, you know, and it was a great time to reflect back on a lot of what has um, a lot of what's happened at Tomatin in the last ten years. I mean. Certainly two great moments in the company's history was when they employed us. I mean, it goes without saying. <laughs> um, but I think... Uh, on you go. No, I was going to say also when they terminated their contract as well. But... <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the 20s is a bad decade. Right? Yeah. Oh, we had a good run. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, no, so... 
I think what's been interesting, we both came in, uh, I started 2012, you started 2013, so quite early in the decade. And to see where the company has gone in that 10 years has been unbelievable. Um, 2010, we had three products in our range. We had a 12, a 15, and an 18. And now we have probably one of the most diverse ranges in the Scotch whiskey industry. I, I don't have any... Um, qualms about saying that i'm very proud to say that and um i mean we we went from being the biggest distillery in the world in the 1970s to in 2016 winning the award for distiller of the year you know it's what what a change of pace and a uh, change of fortunes and it's, it's just been up and up since then exactly i mean it, um... You, yeah, you only had to look at the, the core range and um, to see it at the time. I mean, obviously, it had taken place the the whiskies that were involved in our core range. I mean, I, I didn't. I think the year I started, the fourteen year old was introduced into the range, or was it the year after two thousand and fourteen? I think, and ever since then, you just got when you compare it to what everybody else is doing, you you, you are very proud of what we've done. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's an interesting thing, you know, we, we both have a commercial whiskey background. You're, uh, for, I actually didn't even introduce you properly. Scott is our regional sales manager and looks after uh, our sales in America, Canada, France, Italy. Uh, you, you have quite a widespread, uh, Israel as well. So um, quite quite a large coverage. Um, and we, we quite often have commercial chats and it's very easy to look outward and see other companies and go, how have they done that? But when we take a step back and look over what's been achieved at Tomatin in the last 10 years and something I'm proud to be part of, it's, it's an incredible, incredible thing. Exactly. And I think what we're both lucky to have done is to have learned from everything that's happened as well. You know, we've seen all the processes that have been put in place in terms of the whiskey creation, in terms of the marketing, in terms of the just been, been able to talk to people about our whiskey. And like you say, it's been it's been a hell of a ride, but it's been awfully good fun as well. Yeah, so if we go down tonight, uh, it's, it's all right. Uh, but that, that's, that's another thing, you know, we were talking about our kind of whiskey journeys and whiskey experiences. Um, like you said very early on, we are in an incredibly fortunate position. We get to travel the world drinking whiskies with people. Is there a moment in your career, um, uh, and it's maybe a challenge to even pick one, maybe a couple of moments, where you've kind of taken a step back and gone, this is incredible. I'm going to remember this for a long, long time. There's, yeah, I mean, there's there's two there's two ways that I can answer this. So, one of them, which is probably the most obvious one, that somebody that comes. I live in a village of three thousand people in the Highlands of Scotland. I live in the same village that I've lived in the majority of my life. Um, it's been a uh, incredible experience to be part of Tomatin and then when they said to me do you want to go out to the United States I'd never been to the United States before so traveling about all these big cities and seeing these iconic landmarks there was one moment I remember sitting in a rooftop bar in Manhattan looking out drinking to Matt an 18 year old going this is okay <laughs> you know this yeah. is, <laughs> we've done pretty well here <laughs> you know <laughs> I was like um, four years ago I think I was, I was manager uh, at Bar in Inverness and it's, it's amazing to see the, the transformation over those over those four years but I, I think one of the most um, one of the one of the most memorable tastings that I'll ever have was in Denmark and you know I know that you've been to Jutland in Denmark recently Scott you know you've flown into Karup airports, yeah. Yeah. airports. Yeah. I, ne I never thought I'd fly into an airport smaller than Inverness but we've ma <laughs> we definitely have managed it um, and we we flow uh, we we were driving about Jutland and then the Friday nights we had a tasting in this little place called Abeltoft which is Appletown in Danish and right. And we drive into this town and it's the smallest, it's a, it's a relatively small village. And we go into the village hall where the tasting is going to be. And they start talking, uh, 120 people are coming. There's no way 120 people are going to come to this tasting. And sure enough, 120 people came to the tasting. It was 
amazing food, you know, a lot of like sort of local Danish food. Um, obviously, Apeltoff, Apple Town, there was a lot of apples in, in some yeah. of the dishes, but we had everything from meat, cheese, to desserts. Uh, and then afterwards, just the reception we had, every single person stayed back just to buy a bottle of tomato. Because, and I will always remember that tasting because I was, it was a time where you should never judge a book by your cover and just be grateful for the places that you're in. And yeah, yeah that, that, that's probably the most memorable one. And that's the one where I go, oh, I, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. What, about yeah. what was your, what was your mo moment? Uh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've got past that now. It's uh, I've, I've allowed that to go into the bad memory bucket. Um, no, I, I think for me, mine's until now, uh, well, it has been a very, very clear one, and it happened not too long ago. Um, so I was in Lucerne in Switzerland, which was actually meant to be my next trip. I was meant to be going there uh, this week. And I actually just got the email today to say that the flights have been cancelled, which is, I wasn't going to go anyway, but of course, a shame. Um, so it had been two years ago this week. And in Lucerne that year, they had a, um, a thing where they said, you know, anybody who's staying in a hotel gets a free travel pass, which included buses, rails, and also funicular railways. So anyone that's been to Lucerne, there's this massive, massive, it's an, it's an Alp. I, didn't, I don't think there is a, a singular for Alps, but it's an Alp. And, um, and we got to go up it. And I was in this tiny little pod hanging tens, hundreds of meters above the ground. And I'm sitting with uh, Andy Bell from Aaron Distillery and Ronan Curry, who was at Springbank at the time, now at Glenallachy. And we've got a bottle of whiskey in our hands. And we get to the top of this mountain and we have a small little sample cup. And it just goes to show, you know, you don't always have to have a Glen Cairn. You know, we had small little plastic sample cups and we're drinking a bottle of whiskey on top of an Alp, looking out over Lake Lucerne, thinking, this is all right. You know, <laughs> done, done well, yeah. yeah like say, it, it is amazing. I mean, had you've, worse been, <laughs> you've been some great places all around the world i've been some great places all around the world yeah just I, nobody told us at school that this was going to be a job that you could have but very lucky that we've been able to find it what what stands out as a place for you that you thought i don't know how it, like I, so america you'd never been there before but there was every chance that you would go to america is there anywhere you've been that you've thought i never expected in my life to be in this country I've always had a bit of the travelling bug, Scott, to be honest. You know, before I started at Tomatin, I'd been to sort of Australia, South Africa, I've been to China, I've been to Japan. So I was quite lucky in that sense that um, my university career took longer than I expected. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> spun it out over a few, a few extra years. But I, I mean, I think getting to go to South America was a highlight, getting to go to Argentina, to Chile going into Mexico City. I suppose Mexico City was one that I never thought about. I'd always maybe thought about going to Mexico, but going to Mexico City and to be blown away by the food and the culture, people, their love for whiskey, uh, you know, also their love for mezcal and tequila as well. Just, yeah. I think, yeah, it's so fortunate. I would say probably South America, but I'd, I'd love to say that I'd go back to South I'd, I hope that I'd go back to South America one day. If yeah. it's not for work, I'll definitely go back to socialise. Good, good. I just realised we've not talked a lot about... Um, whiskey. <laughs> this whiskey. whiskey. So what we've got here, um, for those that have been following along, this is from 2013, the year that Scott started at the distillery. So nice for you to see what was going on that year. Um, yeah. And well, this is a second fill French oak cask. So what I find second. from second fills is that there's still a huge amount of influence from the oak, but what's great about this and why it's a very important ingredient in decades is that there's so much of the distillery character coming through, uh, so much of that lighter, citrusy, uh, vibrant notes that we, we know from having tried tomatin spirits and younger tomatin styles. Exactly. I think, as well, it probably gives us a chance to talk about how good tomatin spirit is as well. I mean, tomato, yep. the spirit from tomatin is is a great drink on its own. I mean, 
perhaps not drinking it with 70% alcohol, um, but when you t take it down to sort of between about 45, 50%, you get those lovely big orchard fruits coming through, the apples, the pears, the maltiness coming through as well. And I, when you nose this, that it, it's almost like, like you said, when you added water into the Verdeo casks, it's muted. It's mm -hmm. muted down the spirit a little bit, but you can also, you can also smell how it's ma managed to mellow it out a little bit as well. Big time. So also really enjoy. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> what was really interesting for me about this book when I took it to tasting was before we would try the decades, I was ask I would ask people um what their favorite of the five individual components was, you know. Um and of course the nineteen eighties got a big uh, amount of that because it's such a big sherry flavour. If you like sherry whiskies, that's going to be the one. But I think what I was most surprised about was how many people really loved this whiskey. Um, there's, for a young whiskey, the amount of character and complexity in this alone is is quite interesting. It is, and I think that that's a compliment to the distillers at Tomatin and the skill that they have. Um, and that they've been passing down from generation to generation. And I think you know, each one of these whiskies has been a celebration of all those people that work at Tomatin for various different reasons. We're very lucky that we still have people that work there from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, yeah, 90s, you know. And this, to me, is almost like, it's, it's a little doth of the cap and saying, we can, we can produce whiskey at any age and it will stand up against... Lots of other whiskies, whether it be in blind tastings, in 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 flights and bars. I, I think it's just Tomatin's such an all rounder. It takes yeah. so many places that it's so much fun to talk about. Yeah, and that's, that's what makes tastings great as well. I think even if you look at the core range and you get to talk to people about uh, Tomatin legacy, even up to eighteen in in the five whiskies that we've got there. You're you're never at a loss of new things to say because it's such a variety of product, a variety of flavors. Yeah, exactly. But then, and then you taste something like this as well, second fill French oak. It, it, it probably isn't uh, a, a dream cask to put on a, a marketing package from you know to tell people about how do you how do you sell the, the glowiness of a, of a twelve year old French oak second fill? But you put it into a glass and. Everything that you had in the Verdale, that spice, that butteriness, it's just been taken down a little notch. And I think that's probably what's quite important that people understand is that first fill, second fill, third fill, refill, all these different types of casks all play such an important part in our recipes. Yeah, yeah. You know, without yeah, it's never having full one and done. No, because it creates layers within whiskey. You can see yeah. how which I, I'm, I know we're just about to get on to, but you can just see how everything can be linked in. And it's the skill of Graham Unison and to, to what you're doing as well in terms of the whiskey selection. And, and I know that Janice will take a huge part, a huge role in that going forward now that she's just started. But it's, yeah. it's really exciting to see what, what will come out, what we'll be able to taste and, you know, what we'll be able to showcase to the world. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a very exciting time with a lot of exciting liquid to play with. So, um, oh, we've got a, few, a burst of questions come through there. I, I don't know if they all came at the same time or were we delayed at all, but yeah. uh, too many distilleries can't do young whiskies well. Tomatin is outstanding. I regularly tell people that you don't need to spend vast amounts of money on old stuff, legacy 14 casks, strength, they're all stunners. John Wells in Germany, I hope you're doing well, my friend. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um there, I, I quite often find one of the reasons that Tomatin is very good at young whiskies is because we have such a light style. I think some of the distilleries that have a much oilier, heavier base spirit need that little bit of time. But um, yeah, you're right. Things like Legacy and 14 and Cask Strength, they're brilliant. Um, so another question came in there. Um, what changes had been made at Tomatin in the process or casks over the last few years and how will this influence future products that's interesting because i mean in terms of production there was quite a few changes when graham came to the distillery uh, as you'll find out next week graham has a, a big background at, at various distilleries 
up until then, it had been people that had solely worked at Tomatin. So Graham was able to bring in a lot of techniques that um, made us, I, I, I probably, I would say probably added a layer of consistency. So um, moving to, uh, to a balanced system rather than unbalanced, and he'll maybe touch on that next week. Um, that's helped a lot. I, I think in terms of the casks, it's not necessarily um, been that we've changed anything because we still fill first full bourbon barrels, we still fill sherry casks, we still fill refill casks. I think what is different is the um, the level of experimentation and the level of uh, exploration that we've done into cask styles that previously we had never considered. So above me there is our 15-year-old with a five-year finish in Moscatel casks. That's the first time we've ever done anything like that. So the last few years has been a lot about trying new flavors, trying new things, learning from things that have maybe not gone so well and um, jumping on top of things that have gone really well. There's also been the experimentation with yeasts as well, also with the mashes, the size of the mash, just these little things just to try and, and eke out more of the, those sort of prominent characteristics that we want to have in the tomato and spirit. I know Graham will talk about that later on, but it's been, there's, there's been a lot that's been going on, but it's all about trying to create more of the impact of that soft, fruity, malty character. Yeah. And... You were just talking about Denmark there, Scott. Louis has uh, jumped in to say that he's having a distillery edition virgin oak. So for you, Louis, tonight, that would probably be uh, quite close in terms of characteristic to the 1995 that myself and Scott had a wee bit ago. Um, I hope you're doing well, my friend. Uh, Denmark was locked down a day after I left. It was good to see you there and uh, get a drink uh, and hope to get back over pretty soon. So... Um, yeah, so shall we move on to decades then? Let's move on to decades. Decades two. Yeah. You can pour it directly from the bottle. Directly from the bottle, yeah. So like we said at the top of the hour, um, the reason that we're focusing on decades tonight is that we are very, very proud that this whiskey has just won double gold at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Uh, I always like to get people's opinions about competitions and if it if it has a an influence on their the way they drink whiskey. I think for me, what's so great about a medal like this at San Francisco is the way that you earn it. You know, um, this is not just one or two people saying, I like that whiskey or I like this whiskey. This is uh, certainly the last time I checked, 40 professionals, you know, blenders, buyers, um, people that work in the industry getting together and they blind taste loads and loads of products, uh, not just whiskey, you know, they'll have mezcals, tequilas, cognacs, and they can give the product either no award, a bronze, a silver or a gold. And to win a double gold medal, all of the judges have to give you a gold. So that is just a uh, a huge testament to how high a quality this this liquid is. Um, we've tasted through each of the decades that have gone into it. Um, over 60% of the liquid being over 25 years old, a pretty even split over the last two decades. And it's just this massively complex layered whiskey that having tried each of these cask styles tonight, we'll be able to pick out the influence of each of them. Exactly. What do you get initially, Scott? I get a lot of the 70s uh, off the bat. Um, now, I've, I've tried to figure out the reason for that, and I think it's just the bottling strength. So this has been bottled at 46%. And one of the questions that I got when we released this was, why not at a higher strength? Why not at 50%, a little bit higher? And I think for me what it is, is the liquid from the 70s is already in the early 40s, 43 to 45%. And if we had bottled it at a higher strength, I think you lose out on a lot of those flavors. So straight off the bat, I get that tropical flavor. I get that dunnage, um, almost that oily, rancio note that you talk about, Scott. What about you? Yeah, I get that as well. And I think that's obviously that's something that we're probably looking for. But every time that I taste it, I, I know that there's that those nine, every time that I'm nosing it, those 1980s casks come through as well. Just yeah, that, yeah. That, that also sherry that almost, I would say it's 
two thirds of seventies and a third of the eighties in terms of the in terms of the nose, and they're almost battling against each other, which gives you a little bit of a hint of what's to come. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, if somebody told you you're going to have a bottle of whiskey that will cost um, less than two hundred pound, less than two hundred euros, and it tastes like a mix of seventies and eighties liquids, you'd be you'd be pretty happy about that, right? Just yeah, I mean that's on the nose. I know that when you come when it comes to the palate as well, there's just there's even more of that step change that comes through, and you can taste yeah. through all of the years. And I think when you come to understanding a whiskey, it's it's often about the sort of how you feel at that particular time, what you're going what you're going to taste in there, especially something that's as complex as this, because with five different decades, you're you're going to have lots of different step changes and within that as well we tasted through whiskey from the five decades but there's also casks in here that are as old as 1973 so yeah, yeah. you know that just creates those extra layers in in there as well so there's it's not just one of these whiskies from each decade and i think you can go on to our, i don't think i know you can go onto our website and find out all the different vintages that go into tomato decades too yeah and really it shows why it's such a clever whiskey yeah and i think what's um interesting about it certainly from the the transparency point you know i think many people in will be aware of the whole compass box case and how for us it's very difficult as distillers to tell people what is in the bottle but if you go to the website um at the bottom of the decades page you can uh, click a little button that says request more about this liquid and we send you the full product details and the full breakdown and things. And I think what's interesting about this is the fact that you don't just go, there's 70s, there's 80s, there's 90s. They're all very integrated. And it's 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 almost hard to pick out where each flavor is coming from at times. You know, initially the spices from the French oak in the last two decades are not so big, but when you taste it, there's that ginger, there's that cinnamon that you get from those casks. So, yeah, it's almost like that's the the beginning, the beginning and the end are both bookended by the oldest and the youngest whiskey. But yeah. then what plays such a clever role is that you have that mouthfeel and those big vanilla notes from the first Alex Bourbon casks from 1995, just going alongside the that sort of those Verdeo Richard casks, that big impact. And there it's almost that battle between European and American oak inside the middle part of the tasting it's just gorgeous it's yeah lovely I, stuff. it is great whiskey yeah it's, it's stunning it is an incredible incredible liquid and again you'll hear this quite a lot about tomato but the the liquid that you get for your money on a product like this is incredible um there's only 3400 bottles of this so it's not going to last forever um so if, if you do see one, pick it up. It's an incredible, incredible uh, liquid. And we're, we're very lucky to get to try it regularly. Exactly. I and mean, that's it. It's the, and there's a, lovely, there's a lovely story that goes on about it. I think when you're able to link this whiskey back to the people that made it and yeah. to know that there's people that, who are working at the distillery from the very first decade to now this current decade yeah. that have all been involved in this process, it really is a celebration of, of why it's fun to go and work at Tomatin. Definitely, definitely. And I think <clears throat> this as a, I think it, it touches on the point that single malt is very, is, is only single by nature, you know. Um, unless you're buying a single cask, there is an element of blending in every single malt that you try. And this is from, from the point of view of Graham's involvement in this. So Graham came to us in the last decade. So he's using spirits here that had been laid down a long time before him. But the way that he's been able to marry these together, that is, you hear very often, the, the blender's art. It is an incredible, incredible thing to see come together in a product like this. And that is, I, I think, one of my favourite moments um, don't tell my wife, I think uh, obviously the birth of the son and the wedding should probably be up there as well. But definitely one of my favourite moments in whiskey was um, a couple of months before we released this product. I was in Graham's office and he'd he'd pulled his sample together 
and we'd vatted it together. And the nose was very similar to what we have here, but the taste, there was a lot more of those Verdeo casks coming through. There was a lot more of the tannins and the bitterness. And uh, he turned around and said, the best thing I've ever heard, go and get me three more from the 1970s and two more from the 1990s, you know. It was at that moment they realized that we've really only got one accountant at the distillery. And uh, because we travel so much, she's looking at our expenses rather than the casks that have gone in here. So um, <laughs> there was the ability to, I think what I've always uh, admired about Graham is that if he's going to put his name on something, it's going to be the best of the best and there's going to be no compromises there. And that was uh, that was achieved with this. Exactly, yeah. No, and it's a celebration of everyone that works at Tomatin. Uh, I think that's that's all that we really need to say. I, I see a question coming through from John Wells there, or more of a, a little bit of a statement. You know, I mean, in terms of do we really need to know where the flavours are coming from? I, I've always been on a little bit of a journey myself and trying to find out a little bit more about everything that I'm drinking. And yeah. I'm not I'm not somebody that retains knowledge very easily. You know, it's not, I'm not a sponge. I, it doesn't come naturally to me. I love hearing the stories and I love hearing why people's opinions are formed. And I think in terms of like the whiskey industry itself, these stories are what have helped to make it because yeah. the processes are incredibly similar from distillery to distillery, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, a right answer or a wrong answer. It's just that somebody does something in a different way and therefore they they believe that this imparts that specific flavor. So really John, these nobody really knows where the flavors are coming from a lot of the time this is just really our this is really our answers to or what, what we believe happens at tomato yeah neither neither of us have a degree in biochemistry um so we're not going to be picking apart chemicals or anything like that but i think john to your point um it's knowing that the flavors are there yeah um but i think with whiskey the reason that whiskey has grown to be such a popular liquid to scott's point is the people the stories it's uh it's the romanticism around it as well as the the fact that you just get some really high quality drinks drink at very different times for very different reasons with some great people but yeah i i think this decade too is just the start of things to come in terms of multi vintage from tomato. And I think there's going to be a lot more experimentation down this route. So it's something that everybody can have a lot to look forward to and always keep your eyes peeled, keep up to date with us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, our own website. The, with tomato, there's always new products coming. Every year that I've been working at the distillery, we've had something new to talk about. It's been something new for us to learn about as well a lot of the time, but I uh, hopefully you've all enjoyed this as uh, a great distillery to, that's produces some fantastic whiskies. Yeah, and on Scott's point in terms of uh, keeping in touch, I think we're at the point of getting close to wrapping up now. So this week we've done quite a lot of live sessions on Instagram and stuff, and great to see all your feedback and things like that. I think Going over the next few weeks, what we'll probably look to do is every Tuesday night, I will go live on Instagram and focus on one product. And if anyone from the distilleries on Instagram watching, I'll pull them in and we can have a wee chat just about how things are going. A uh, much shorter format than what we're doing uh, right now. So that'll be Tuesday nights, the, the Tomato and Tuesdays. And then on Fridays, we'll we'll have more of this sort of format uh, on YouTube, on Facebook Live, the, the softer side sessions, as we're calling them. And um, that will be people who are whiskey lovers. Like I say, myself and Scott have been able to uh, fall in love with whiskey through Tomatin, and it's been great to hang out tonight. So we'll be uh, we'll be adding in other people next week. It's Graham Munson, a great opportunity for everybody to ask our master distiller questions uh, he's not often on the road um so a great opportunity for everybody and then following that we're going to be speaking to um bar owners whiskey bar owners we're going to be talking to bloggers we're going to be talking to buyers from stores basically the the whiskey industry we're going to have a conversation with um so on that note thank you everybody for joining in scott thank you for taking the time tonight uh, i don't think you had much else planned uh, on this Friday evening um, but I know you'll be a little bit later to the golf course tomorrow morning as a result so thank you for joining in
yeah, no, thanks very much for hosting, Scott. I, I'm sure I'll be uh, checking in with the future tastings, maybe not at nine o'clock on a Friday night, but <laughs> <laughs> well, well past my bedtime, as we all know. But uh, thanks for, very much for everybody that's had a wee listen this evening. Um, I know there's been some local people as well, but keep supporting a lot of these local businesses that keep everything going. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Slanjava. Slanjava.